Good afternoon, Doctor, and uh, thank you for having you here in uh, Siem Reap Province, Cambodia, at our uh, Tomei Tomei office. And uh, I mean, Doctor, I mean, as a, an expert and a specialist in uh, digital education, uh, you've been working in that field for a very long time, in, I, as I was informed, in multiple places in the world, and especially in the US. Mm -hmm. So um, you have been traveling, I mean, uh, afar, I mean, a very lengthy trip from the U.S. to Cambodia, so <laughs> in Phnom Penh and also in uh, Siem Reap. Yeah. So can you tell me, uh, in those uh, places a few days ago and today also in Siem Reap, um, what did you share to the Cambodian people about your expertise? So I've been meeting with um, various universities, public schools, pub private institutions, teacher education schools, um, to talk about, first of all, the idea of now after the pandemic yes. what do we do with online learning and blended learning so rather than going back to the way things were before how do we think about online and blended learning as a strategic part of the mix of mm. what we need to be doing as giving educational systems very much needed flexibility and resilience so instead of simply moving past online learning how can we fold that into the education that we're doing Along with that, if we're going to do online, how do we do that well? Um, so of course, during the pandemic, there was a very quick rush mm. to online learning. People had to move very quickly. They didn't have time to build great online learning. The system, the Many infrastructure. Many folks were frustrated, right? So if we're going to do that well in a meaningful way, then how do we do that? And what does research have to tell us about how to do that well? So the institution in concern are the private sectors, the public school, the... All the, of them. All, all right. of them, yes. Um, all the way from um, how do they do it themselves mm. to how do they prepare teachers, how do they teach their kids, so um, all different conversations. So yes, uh, Doctor, I mean, rewind back for, let's say, a couple of years back to COVID. So, I mean, I know that digitalization in education sector has been, you know, a prioritized, I mean, a priority for, for developing, for developed and developing countries around right. the world. Right. But is it uh, during the COVID itself that, you know, every country take digitalization in education, you know, more seriously than ever before? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, as you said, we certainly saw online learning and digital education before the pandemic. Yes. I mean, research on online learning dates back over 20 years. Um, so, and I've been de designing and teaching online myself for over 20 years, but it wasn't really until during the pandemic that mm -hmm. we had so many schools and institutions and countries co even considering online. Now, since the pandemic, um, we, there's been a definite marked increase in student demand for online learning. So schools and institutions are having to respond to that demand as well. So we're definitely seeing an increase in long-term online learning after the pandemic. So it means that in the U.S., for example, during COVID, students were, let's say, put out of their comfort zone right. in order to study online. And, right. and it's, it's quite a surprise for them also. Uh, right. can, can you elaborate on that? I mean, the, the K, inner working of the society. Sure, yeah. for K-12, so younger learners, yes. that was a very big shift. Most K-12 online learning is not online. Um. So for all of those children moving online, that was a very significant change. Now for college students, there's more online offerings in the U.S. online. At the undergraduates, so for a bachelor's degree, it's less common, but we have a lot of students who take online certificates, mm. online masters, you know, other learning opportunities. Um, and a lot of states in the U.S. actually have a requirement that high school students have to have taken at least one online class mm -hmm. before they graduate, so they at least have some experience in yes. online learning. So there was some experience with that, but not to the scale that we experienced during during, during COVID nineteen. Yes, yeah, right. And yes, doctor. I mean, I mean, I myself was uh, also, you know, experiencing a lot of difficulties. Uh, a good, a good two years of my university life. Right. Um, but I, I noticed there's a, you know, there's a small like difficulty when when we say that online learning, mm -hmm. the teacher actually just like stream you know, the way he teach or she, right. 
Yeah, like right. just just like the plain old right. traditional teaching, but through screen. Right. Or, you know, sometimes there might be, you know, let's say automatic system that you do it yourself. So when you say online learning, mm -hmm. wh what do you mean exactly? Like that traditional way, but That's on a, a screen? <laughs> that is such a lovely question because yeah, yes. I, we, those of us who work in online learning often say education does not equal content. So just delivering content is not enough. That's not an education. It's purely content. Education and learning involves wrapping strategies around that yes. to help students learn the content, to help them apply that, to help them see the connections to their jobs. So when I teach online learning, um, if I present content, it's always recorded and provided to students asynchronously. Yes, yes. When we're together in a live online class like on Zoom, usually we're doing teamwork, group work. I may have students demonstrating things to me, showing me, you know, okay, I've asked you to do X, show me how you do that. Okay, based on what I'm seeing, here's some feedback that I have for you. So online learning includes interaction, yes. includes building social uh, community, social connections with students. Um, we use um, a three-legged or three-pronged approach focus on three types of uh, interaction. Yes, yes. Learner content interaction, learner to learner interaction, and learner to instructor interaction. So what you're describing is purely about learner to content. How can learners receive content? That's not enough. We have to also facilitate learners interacting with each other, sharing knowledge, collaborating, working together, we also have to facilitate learners interacting with the instructor, being mm. able to ask questions, um, ask for clarification, um, having me actually provide supportive, constructive feedback so they can improve their application of that. That's all of what I mean when I talk about online learning, not just the content. But, I mean, frankly speaking, I mean, is it hard to do it, you know, via the wireless network? I mean. It, it's, it's going to be a bit complicated, right? So, so is there anything, you know, like you, you can do to, to minimize, you know, let's say the, the misunderstanding when people talk online, you know, because face-to-face -face would be, I mean, much more preferred. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So um, there's definitely a misconception that face-to-face -face communication oh, okay. is perfect. Mm. Human beings miscommunicate face-to-face -face all the time. Yeah. In fact, what's funny is the more that we study online learning and online interactions, do you want to pause? Oh, it's okay, it's okay. okay. Yeah, don't, don't. Um, the more we actually start to understand human interactions and mm. human collabor collaborations. So um, even in a face-to-face -face environment, there are a lot of times that instructors misinterpret students, yeah, misunderstand yeah. them. In fact, in online learning, we came up with a theory called transactional distance. So it's not just about the physical or geographical distance, but in every interaction, there are these distances that are intellectual, psychological, emotional. Yes, so what yes. we focus on is how do we bridge those distances with our learners? And in fact, that's what I've been sharing with schools is one of the ways online learning has changed me is I now understand that distance exists no matter where I'm at. So I'm always thinking about how do I bridge that distance? Mm. How do I build that relationship? And I apply that both online and in my face-to-face -face teaching. So normally, like I mentioned earlier, so people normally, let's say, um, they think that face-to-face -face communication would be a lot more efficient, but actually not like that. So by right. understanding that, we can embrace online learning much better right. than, than we, we did right. before. In fact, I feel like I know my students better yes. online, and we hear this from teachers that make this transition to online mm. teaching that, especially as they change their practices, and it does become a really significant change to one's teaching practices, but instead of me focusing my time on delivering content, I, let, I record everything, I let the computer and automate all of that. So I'm no longer just the content delivery vehicle. That allows me to spend my time reading students' work, getting mm. to know them. So now instead of simply delivering content and giving a test, I actually ha have my students watch and read on their own. Yes. And then when we meet, I have them bring their work to me and I evaluate their work. 
I know my students' strengths and weaknesses better, and I'm able to give them a lot more feedback for continuous improvement throughout a class. So I, I hardly even use tests anymore. Mm. I use a lot of assignments and submissions from students, and I have them break it down into multiple deliverables, so I really know what do they understand, what do they not understand, and how can I give them feedback to help them develop. So I feel like I get to know my students a lot more. And again, we hear this from other instructors. We also hear that from our students. Um, one of my students shared that uh, she had done her bachelor's degree in yes. person oh. at the university. And then she did her master's degree online with us. And after she completed her master's online, she said, I actually felt like I got to know my fellow students and my instructors so much better in the online program than I did face to face. That's because of how we designed our online program. We intentionally designed it to facilitate a lot of that interaction I was telling you about. Students were interacting with each other all the time, and they were interacting with us as instructors all the time. But, uh, yes, doctor, but in, in that case, I mean, even though we interact a lot on, on you know, the virtual world, I mean, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it is still the virtual world. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also have, you know, my, my own personal uh, experience in my university is that sometimes, uh, or, or maybe, uh, that, was, uh, that, that was because I didn't take the online, you know, thinking to the limit. Mm -hmm. But there is a small, you know, difficulty that we don't, interact with each other, you know, the, the human to human way. And sometimes the professors and, uh, you know, other instructors do not know us very well talking to us, you know, via the screen. So do you think about that, you know, by embracing, embracing the, the, you know, online education, online learning, will it jeopardize, you know, the, the friendship, you know, the physical contact. No, I don't, because that's not been my experience. Oh. That's not been the experience. And also research doesn't bear that out. So um, the way to think about it from both experience and research yes. is that it's not the technology, it's the design. So you can have a poorly designed online learning experience. Yes. yes. You can also have a poorly designed face-to-face -face learning experience. And students will tell you they've been in classes where they don't get to know their peers, they don't get to know the instructor, they mm. simply show up, sit, receive their content, go away, right? It's all about how we design it. So I can design a very interactive online learning experience or I can design one that's not interactive at all. I can design one where I get to know my students, where we all get to know each other and we do develop those relationships or I can design a class where we don't. So I'm. I know folks have experienced online learning where that hasn't happened. Yes, yes. It's not a function of online or the technology. It's a function of the way that the instruction has been designed. So, now so for the yeah, pandemic, yeah, yes, what happened was so many people had to put stuff online mm -hmm. very quickly. Mm. When we develop quality online learning, it takes months to put that together, mm. not weeks. <laughs> In yeah. fact, for high quality on online learning, you usually want your course designed and structured so that on the first day that you deliver your class, it's all set in stone. There was no way for faculty, for teachers to do that during the pandemic. Mm. What that also meant is folks learned some really bad habits about how to do online learning. So I feel like the conversation right now is actually helping instructors break some bad habits around online learning so it can be more effective, more social. Yes, uh, doctor, but to an average, you know, Cambodian audience is watching the video, they might get a bit, let's say, not really, I mean, not, not a very clear understanding on, on what you might say a well-designed and a well-structured online learning. So uh -huh. can you give like one or two examples? I mean, sure. what, what, what is that exactly? Yes. Sure. Okay. So for well-designed online learning, first of all, we start by breaking it down very carefully. What content is going to be delivered? When is that going to happen? What are the strategies that we're going to use to engage students with that content? Mm -hmm. So instead of just reading or watching videos, what do I want you doing with that content? Maybe I want you working out a math problem. Mm -hmm. Maybe yes. I want you developing a business plan as part of your class. Maybe if you're a teacher, I want you developing a lesson plan. I want you to show me how are you applying what you're learning. And then they might, students turn in that assignment and we would provide them feedback. Now, I teach classes that are asynchronous 
and I also teach classes that are both synchronous and asynchronous. It really depends on the learners. But for the classes that are asynchronous, we have a lot of discussions going. The way that I structure my discussions are not simply tell me about what you read, but I might give my students a case study or a scenario and say, I want you to take what you read and I want you to apply it to this. And I mm -hmm. want you to analyze that and really dig into this. And then we're going to share our responses and come up with a joint response. Or I might have students working together in a group project where I want them to develop a product or resource together. Um, other times I have students working independently on independent projects, say, you know, teachers who are putting together lesson plans, they need to do that independently, but I'll still put them in groups so they can share ideas with each mm. other and also give each other feedback on that. And then once they do the peer feedback, then it gets submitted to me and I provide them my feedback. So another feature is that a well-organized online course is laid out first day to last day. So if you think about how you do all of your planning for videos and everything, you know exactly what you're gonna do, you have your process. We do the same thing for online, especially when we support folks developing that. So we sit down and we come up with a plan for what are you doing week by week, day mm. by day. We put all of that together so that it's in place by the time everything goes live. We also build in a lot of other supports for students. A lot of students don't know how to be good online learners. So it's something we call self-regulation. So we build orientations for students. You mean self-discipline to be? Self-discipline uh, yeah. is a good word for yeah, that. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Um, it's also like managing their environment for learning, managing their own, learn, understanding themselves as learners better, what's effective for them, how do they manage their time. So we actually teach students how to do all of that as part of the online learning process. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of elements. In fact, when we studied, uh, studied online learning, the tendency is to compare face-to-face -face as, as if it's just a room versus a computer. Mm -hmm. That's a yeah. very simplistic view of it. Okay. There's yeah. so many different variables that go into designing effective instruction, both in the classroom and online. In fact, for online, we've identified at least 33 variables so far that all influence the quality of the experience and the effectiveness of it. Those are a lot of decision points. So if you don't know some of those, you don't know how to make them, of course a class is not gonna be that great. My first class I took as an online student was awful. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I never thought yes. I would be sitting here talking with you about this. But I've definitely learned over time and we've studied this over time and we have very reliable techniques and strategies for how to make it more effective, more social, more satisfactory. Yes, Doctor, but so, so if I put it uh, as the way I, I understand it, so the online way that we learn during COVID it's not, it's not really the best it's one really so great. far because no. you know the, all of the hectic and the shortcomings. Right. But the, the, the online learning that we design for the future will be not like this one anymore. I yeah. hope. Yeah. And that's what I hope my conversations help folks with yes, is yes. how to move past online learning and what it looked like in the pandemic to what it really should be and can be if we design it well. Okay, but doctor, I mean for let's say younger people who were born during the year 2000, I think it is easy for them to, to adapt to online learning, I mean, at, I mean for now. Um, but how about, you know, the, let's say the middle-aged teacher or the older age teacher who, you know, who have traditional, traditionally teach in class, I mean, I mean, is it hard for them? I mean, as you know it? So we don't really see generational differences. That's okay. probably surprising, but oh, okay. just because kids are born in 2000 and they learn how to use these devices yes, yes. for whatever doesn't really make them great online learners. Um, by that same token, I mean, my generation built the internet. <laughs> we understand <laughs> But, but it really for example, well. in the case of you know, developing countries like Cambodia, you know, the generation before, they were not really Mm -hmm. adapted to the internet so mm -hmm. so if you were to design it's more, it is definitely yeah. more about one's experience with technology yes but also we find folks who don't have any experience with technology can be very adaptive very mm -hmm. flexible um, others may not be so open to learning it's really on an individual to individual basis so i've worked with folks who never used any technology and help them move online 
were fantastic educators online. I've also worked with others who did really struggle to make the adaptation. Mm. So we don't we don't tend to see generational differences per se. Um, but you definitely will see differences with individuals. Some people take much longer to develop their comfort with it. In fact, when, a, a rule of thumb when helping faculty or teachers move online yes. is that it usually takes them about three years to really develop their comfort and their voice teaching online. Now, we also see that in face-to-face -face teaching. A brand new teacher mm -hmm. is not comfortable in the classroom that first year. Mm, it I takes see. them a few years to develop their comfort, develop their whole repertoire, and really feel like they've they've matured as a teacher. So we, we see that same process in all of the modalities. So basically online or not online, it's there's it's time. There, there's, there's time, just time that to mature, to time. grow, develop, find one's teaching voice. Yes, doctor. But at the same time, you were mentioning about you know the variables in, in online learning. There, are, let's say thirty or something like that. Mm -hmm. So how about you know I mean taking Cambodia as the context, you know there are a gap in in the rural areas and there's a gap in in the urban areas and mm -hmm. um, so how about you know logistically. If we, I mean, of course, everything takes time. Yeah. But in order to bring like at a good pace, at a good, you know, uh, let's say level. So, I mean, does it need a lot of infrastructure to do it? Like good computer? So this is where I think the whole idea of an ecosystem is really important. Yes. No one modality is the end all be all. No modality is the single solution. Just like face-to-face -face has its own limitations, yes. which we've experienced, online has its limitations too. There may be times, and there are a lot of instances, a lot of countries that are building out their mobile infrastructure. So instead of relying on the internet or online specifically, they're really developing more um, uh, broadband and uh, mobile connectivity. Mm -hmm. So instead of getting on the computer connecting to the internet, they're doing more education through devices, yes. tablets that connect to their mobile plan. We actually use a lot of that in New Mexico, the state that I'm from. We have very rural areas mm -hmm. because we have like Native American reservations, yes, yes. right? That are very large, very sparsely populated. They don't have the same infrastructure as say New York City. So in those areas, we actually use mobile infrastructure to be able to provide any sort of education at a distance. Oh, what do you mean by mobile infrastructure? You mean like mobile... Cell towers. Oh, oh cell towers. Yeah, what your yeah. device connects to. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, so if you're not connected to the internet on your device, you're connected to a cell tower. That's what's giving you, that's what's causing the information to flow back and forth. That's really robust infrastructure, actually, that you can tap into. And we are seeing a lot of countries that are just sort of leapfrogging over the internet and going straight to mobile as their infrastructure. Mm. So, so if you were wanting to, if you were wanting to deliver distance or remote education out to rural areas, I probably wouldn't rely on online infrastructure, the internet. Yes, probably yeah. would switch to mobile. Now, the line between online and mobile is very blurry. There's a lot of the tools that we use for online learning that are available on mobile devices yes, and no. through mobile connectivity as well. So that line is getting really blurry. So if I were looking to expand infrastructure in a place like Cambodia, I actually probably would be thinking about expanding mobile connectivity, like more cell towers more cell and tower. being able to provide more affordable devices to people. Yes, Doctor. So yeah. Again, it is still something that takes time, but it, it's it not impossible to do. Yeah. Yes, so on that point, there was an interesting study that looked at the schools and institutions that fared well during the pandemic. The ones that did okay, that had no problem, didn't really seem to have their feathers ruffled, those were ones that had been doing online and mobile learning for at least 10 years. Mm. Now what that means is they built an infrastructure and they'd also develop those habits. So just like you're talking about, it takes time for people to learn, it takes time for them to be comfortable. Those were institutions where they'd had that time, they'd taken that time, and they had already made the investment. So I get it. A lot of places have not made that investment now. 
um, today's a great day to start. <laughs> <laughs> so that in two, three, five years, if there's another disruption, then you've got the infrastructure, and then you've also got the habits of using, interacting, all of that that's already built. Yes, Doctor. But I mean, generally speaking for Cambodia, I mean, during COVID, uh, despite the hecticness and mm -hmm. despite all the shortcomings, because it, is, it was so quick. Mm -hmm. So based on your um, opinion, based on your view, I mean, h how good is Cambodia in, in managing online learning during, during that uh, distress time? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's specific to Cambodia. Yeah, yeah. Very few places managed it well, including mm. the United States. Yeah, yeah. We had a lot of communities that don't have widespread internet. Mm. They struggled too. Really, the only country that I think managed it well during the pandemic was Australia. Australia. The reason Australia was in such a good position was because they have been investing in distance education mm. for decades. Is so it not because just online. The, the dispersed uh, territory? Is They're it? extremely oh, spread out, right? Okay. Large yeah. country, lots of rural, very yes. hard to access. We've got lots of districts, right, where students are very spread out. Mm. So they've been implementing all kinds of different types of distance education for decades. So they, they've they implemented uh, what's called correspondence courses where they have a whole print infrastructure. They've made use of telephone, radio, video. Mm. They developed video conferencing capabilities to connect different sites to each other. Yes. When internet came along, they developed online learning and then they've also been exploring with mobile learning. So when the pandemic hit for them, it was almost like they just had a menu of options to choose from where they could go right down the line. You know, do you have online? Great, if so, use it. If not, do you have radio and television? Great, if so, use it. If not, what about the print infrastructure? Most places didn't have that. So I don't think Cambodia did any worse than anybody yeah, else. Yeah. Not only that, having met with folks at the schools this week, you guys have some really innovative people are thinking about and building great ideas, entire programs, very creative online classes. I think what I've been seeing this week is Cambodians who are innovating and creating wonderful solutions. That's actually inspiring. And I wish other countries would do that too. A lot of other countries are, some aren't. But I think the fact that folks are having a dialogue right now about what do we do? How do we do that better? That's a big positive. I think that's to be commended. Yes, Doctor. At the same time, you also focus a lot on the, um, let's say, the artificial intelligence and, you know, the recent occurrence of chat GPT mm -hmm. and also, you know, other, let's say, automatic system that allow students to, to eat their work. Yep. For example, uh, Grammarly. Yep. That, you know, a very famous one, you <laughs> know, they correct your grammar, your sentences. Yep. Um, it's good for people to learn. I mean, on, on I mean, it gives the opportunity to more people to learn and to do right. better. Right. But at the same time, there's you know there's a catch. Like, don't do, I mean, doesn't it make you less, you know, attentive to to pursue perfection on your own? It definitely can. It definitely uh, yeah, can. Yeah. There's, uh, in fact, the, one of the books I just wrote is on ethical issues related yes, to. Yes learning technologies, AI has a load of ethical issues that come mm. along with it. So the approach we've taken, now some of my colleagues have decided to ban AI. It's not allowed in their classes. If a student is caught using it, they will receive an honor violation mm. or be accused of plagiarism. The problem is that there's not actually any really good AI detection tools. Um, some companies like Turnitin or even ChatGPT themselves, they tried to develop tools to detect when something has been developed by AI. Mm, they yes. can't. Oh. Uh, in fact, both of those companies have abandoned developing those tools because they cannot reliably so detect So it's, it's, not, it's not easy just to reverse engineer the exactly. system. No, no, it's not exactly. like that. So that doesn't give any, that doesn't give schools or educators tools, mm. right, to be able to tell what a student has done. The approach we have decided to take is that our goal is not simply to teach tools. It's a very simple approach to education. Our job as educators is to help students develop critical thinking and discernment. 
So what we're focusing on with our students, we've chosen to say, we're gonna teach you not only how to use the tools, but how to think about these tools too. Mm. Because my classroom is not the only universe, right? It's not the only world that exists. Students are gonna go out into jobs and they may make use of these tools on the job or they may not. They may make uses of these tools that actually put their jobs or careers in jeopardy. So we talk about that. We actually provide students cases and talk about, for example, there were two lawyers in the US who used ChatGPT to write a brief for their court. Mm -hmm. uh, and they submitted this brief to the court. The brief cited case law that did not exist because that's what ChatGPT does. It doesn't actually go out and find things and cite it. It's a language prediction model. So it puts together what looks like citations or case law. So the judge is reading through this and notices these references and notices that these don't exist and start asking questions and finds out the lawyers completely fabricated this. Their case was tossed out. They lost their case and they were disbarred. They lost their law licenses. So we share examples like that with students to say, look, if you make poor decisions with this technology, it can have dire consequences for you. Mm -hmm. So what we want to do is help you develop a decision-making process. How do you use these tools well? We use productivity tools all the time, right? We use Word, Excel, PowerPoint. You mentioned Grammarly. Yes, That's a yes. very common one. We use these tools all the time to support us and help us with things. There are cases of that that are okay. There are times when that's not okay, where we're fabricating or we're not really doing the work. So we also talk about students about what's the difference between productivity, using a tool for productivity, and learning. And when could your use of the tool actually interfere with your learning? And how do you decide when to use a tool to support productivity and when to not use it so you're not interfering with your own learning, when you're not doing that hard work, like you say. Mm. I can't control everything a student does, none of us can, but what I do hope is that they develop a decision-making, a critical thinking process. A common sense to right. it. Right, yeah, yeah. and, and a guiding moral or ethical principles for how they use not just AI, but other technology in their lives too. So I think that's what our responsibility as educators is, to help them develop the decision-making and guiding morals and principles for their decision-making. Yes, Doctor, but just to expand the scope a bit, um, for example, um, these days they talk about, let's say, especially in Singapore, mm -hmm. they talk about a smart nation, you know, including smart society, sorry, uh, digital right. society, digital economy, digital right. uh, government. Um, but, I mean, I mean, from your uh, perspective mm -hmm. uh, in, in the you know, digital world, I mean, what, what is that? What, what is a smart nation? But simply oh, put. <laughs> that's a good question. I think every nation yeah. is going to have their own vision for what that means. Oh, okay. If I were crafting what that means, I think it would mean that we're using technology to benefit human beings. Mm. Now, there are a lot of ways that technology gets used that it doesn't benefit human beings, right? And so in order to guide that, you have to have laws, policies, you have to have practices, you have to have a conversation about what those potential harms and issues really are. And then you've got to develop guardrails. And so I know like the EU is having conversations about that, about what is effective use of that. UNESCO has actually issued guidelines around AI and the use of AI. Ultimately, and this is actually a message I share, this is why I say it's not the technology, it's the design. It's really not the technology that does it. It's we as humans who decide what we're going to do with it. So we're the ones who have to shape what's the society that we're gonna build with that. But most of the time, let's say, regulation is not really as fast as the advancement of technology. Yeah. So normally regulation should be more, I mean, faster <laughs> to, to, catch, to yeah. catch up with what, what's yeah. out there. You know, I read a really good quote recently by a colleague who does work on AI and yes. ethic per ethics related to AI and everything. And she said, there's no excuse for regulation to not keep up with innovation. We really should be developing policies that both imagine possible futures and that, and we should be moving quickly to implement policy now that mm. helps address these issues. The argument that regulation doesn't keep up is an artifact of us taking too long to do things. 
these are all processes that we probably could actually speed up some. So yes, there's a lag. Does there have to be such a lag? I don't think so. I also think if you involved experts in these technologies, in informing uh, policies, like that's what UNESCO did. They went out, they gathered a bunch of experts and said, what do good policies look like on this? Mm. You know, there are documents and resources now that could be informing politicians and decision makers on policy. It's up to them to make good use of that or not. Yes, doctor. But just, uh, you know, just uh, let's say not a clear vision, but you know, just like an imagination for the future, let's say 10 years or 20 years from now, do you, you know, do you like think that, okay, uh, you know, the online class will take over the majority no. of the school? <laughs> and, you know, no, not, not like that. No, 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 no. In no. fact, again, that, com that comes back to that idea of the educational ecosystem. Mm, so if you yeah. think of like a biological system, and how there's multiple species within that, right? Um, that's what the educational ecosystem is going to look like. There's gonna be these different varieties, different modalities, online, blended, face-to-face, -face, mobile, all in this mix together. For K-12, I very sincerely doubt that anything's gonna be more dominant than face-to-face. -face. You know, mm. I, I don't really like to predict because who knows what's gonna change things. Yes. But most of what I'm seeing is predominantly face-to-face -face with some online learning, maybe some additional blended learning and uh, emerging mobile learning, integrating into that. For higher education, that mix is a little bit more closer to about 50-50. Mm -hmm. So still gonna have mainly face-to-face but there's gonna be more online learning opportunities, more blended learning opportunities and use of mobile for that as well. So, so it's a mix yeah, it's a mix, yes. Yeah, and that's the thing is we have, to, we have to strategically decide which of those options make sense when for different learners, depending on the content, what our objectives are, what the infrastructure is. So we really have to be strategic and thoughtful about what options we select. So simply speaking, young people would prefer more human-to-human -human interaction than, you know, I mean, you, you're not going to expect that, you know, a six years old will wear a VR. That's not no. quite oh. what yeah. I'm saying. I wouldn't yeah. say it that way, okay, actually. Yeah. What I would say is that, in fact, students are expressing more preference yes. for mm. online and blended learning, but they still also want face-to-face. -face. Mm. So what they want is a mix of it. A mix of it, right? Yes. And we're seeing students do that. Well, they'll take a couple of face-to-face -face classes and a couple of online classes because they like the flexibility that online affords them. But then they, there's certain things I also like about face-to-face. -face. So that's more of what we're seeing is students actually requesting a mix of these learning opportunities. Which one of those is predominant? No, not not really sure. About right, that, yeah. and and that depends on the survey and who's being surveyed and and things like that. So, so basically, every variable. every situation demands its own attention to to exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, yeah that's a great. Yeah. In fact, it's it's that's such a great takeaway. I think I would like underline <laughs> it three times and put three exclamation points yeah. there. That everything has to be designed for the particular situation and context. Um, you can't take what another entity is doing and plug it in over here because maybe the infrastructure is different. Maybe student demand and interest is different. Uh, maybe there are different needs, you know. So it really has to start with who are we trying to serve? What are our needs? What's our infrastructure for doing that? And then based on all of that, what do we build to, to try to best meet the needs the best mm. way that we possibly can? Yes, doctor. But just a very last question and sure. um, <laughs> to also the closing question also. Your first time in Cambodia, as yes. I was informed. Yeah. So how, how is the country to you? <laughs> how is the country? It's yeah. lovely. Yeah. I have really enjoyed Cambodia. I mean, it's, it's beautiful. I've enjoyed getting out and seeing. I've been in Phnom Penh in Siam Reap. Yes. Um, and we've, uh, we've taken the tuk-tuks around mm. and walked to different places. Um, we've enjoyed a lot of great food. Every place that I've been has been gracious to serve wonderful local fruit. 
Um, uh, sticky rice with jackfruit is probably now my new favorite. <laughs> um, uh, the the bean cakes as mm, well, those are lovely. Yes, yes, We've had a muk. Um, we've had all kinds of dishes. So, no, I, I told the colleague who's helping me around here that um, I'm already planning to bring my family back. Oh, okay. So it's, yes. it's lovely. People have been so friendly. Yes, I've so. really enjoyed the dialogue with folks. Folks are interested in learning trying to do better, trying to make it, you know, make what they're doing better. So it's really been a lovely time all around. Yes, Doctor. So thank you for your conversation, Doctor, and about digital education. And it, it's, a, it's, it's a very informative uh, information all along. Yes, thank and you. I hope you have a good stay in Cambodia. Thank you. Thank <laughs> yes, you for yes. your time. So thank you, Doctor.